Hello, I'm Scott Triggs. My guest today is a true artist and talented tech. I met him for the first time earlier this year on the Premier Pixel Protocol Masterclass at DC Micro in GoldenEye, UK, Yorkshire. Following our usual informal introductions, I was immediately struck by his self-deprecating candour and open honesty. And not exactly what you'd call a typical journey into our industry, in fact, far from it. He is quick to laugh, has something to say for himself, he's ambitious, focused, driven, and makes no bones about the fact that his business partner and wife Victoria is the power behind the throne. From boxer, soldier, fitness instructor, gym and spa manager, and corporate headhunter, to microplay tech, PMU tech, and trainer. Co-owner of House of Aesthetics and Bellate Beauty and Skincare Education, firm advocate for the cohesion of the PMU and traditional tattoo industries, he is a real artist and a real gentleman. I'd like you to meet, and I'd like to welcome, Mr. Ian Walker to spill the tea. Go and take a look. Mr. Walker, you hail from Gateshead in the north, and in your own words, describe the area which you grew up in and went to school as one of the roughest in the city. You left school with pretty much no qualifications whatsoever except for art, and you recall that you've drawn and sketched for as long as you can remember. In fact, at the age of four, your mum went into hospital to have your sister, and you took that time to make a mural of her and the baby, all the way up the staircase wall. Is it true that your mum used to give you rolls of plain wallpaper when you were little, and you would roll them out and draw on them for hours and hours? For hours. Really? Yeah, hours for hours. You must have been a great kid. She must have been blessed with you then. All she had I, was to awful. Do I was awful, but that was, that was one thing that would keep you quiet. Excellent. Um, you say that you always drew faces um, and, and that you were drawn to art from a really, really early age. Um, for many lads in your position, leaving school with no qualifications or at least clear direction, um, the options were you either boxed or became involved in local gangs and drugs. You started boxing at the age of 10 and you loved it. At the age of 16, you decided to join the army as an infantry soldier, um, though it's fair to say you had a rather short career due to an injury you picked up during P Company training to join the Parachute Regiment. The Parachute Regiment? Is, yeah. that, what you're, is that what you wanted? The Parachute Regiment? I wanted to jump out of planes and shoot guns at that age. Yeah. That is, you just Young wanted, lad. You wanted to join the Paris. That was... Yeah, that, that was it. That was it. In fact, upon leaving, it was a case of I could have switched to another regiment and I told the medic at the time that I'd rather be a civvy than a hat. Um, so I think that would have... Say again, you'd rather be... I'd rather be a civilian than join another regiment. Um, really? So, yeah, stamp the discharge papers and wow. here we go. <laughs> wow. Um, so, at the age of 18, you decided to become a soldier. Um, that was cut short by an injury that you had. You very sadly lost your mum at the age of 17 through what was then assumed to be sudden adult death syndrome, which left you, a young man, not entirely tethered to one thing or another, um, in your own words, um, tethered really to nothing except your own self-interest. And that could have been a time or the start of a potentially very, very rocky path. However, you continued to box, possibly keeping you I wonder whether that helped keep you on the straight and narrow in some way. Um, the discipline of boxing, I mean. Um, eventually signing up to becoming a personal trainer. And at 19, you went on to qualify as a personal trainer, progressing to uh, gym spa general manager. Your first taste then of the health and beauty industry. So I, this is interesting because all uh, your, your story, I think, is fantastic. It's very, very interesting. But there are these constant dichotomies. On the one hand, you had a, a tough start. Um, you signed up as a personal trainer. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, boxing, personal trainer, and now spa, kind of yeah. the beauty industry. We're heading towards that a little bit. Um, this was really your first taste taste of the health and beauty industry, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Then came the birth of Budget Gyms, which saw you join a company called Exercise for Less, the national gym chain, when they had, in fact, just one gym, I believe. And yeah. did yeah. you spend some time, because I'm originally from Swansea, and there's an Exercise for Less yeah. in Swansea. Swansea. We spoke about that when we last caught up. Yeah. yeah, it was Swansea Club that I launched down there. Yeah, that was neat towards the end of me leaving with them. But yeah, it was good. I had a good time. Did you? How, how long ago was that, Ian? 
eight, seven years now? Eight, seven years ago, yeah, that, that, that would be about right. By the um, age of 26, you would move to impact sales and company trainer working for the same company. Your new role seeing you working all across the UK, turning around underperforming clubs and launching branded new clubs and gyms. And incredibly, in a pre-sale phase, you would take membership from zero to 4,000 signups. And I know nothing about this industry, mate, but that sounds almost unbelievable to me. From, from no, zero to 4,000, that's crazy. I think, I think a lot of it was the, it was the birth of the budget club. Um, you know, the timing was right for the industry. Now you find them everywhere. But in addition to that, it was always this ethos of, Every time that you got somebody in front of you was referral, referral, referral. So every time I'm, I'm literally taking phones off people, going right through the phone book, getting 30, 40, 50 leads, wow. not just five or six, but at an immense level. Um, and it, it works. We, we hired young people that didn't really have any ties. We could work them really, really hard. And they didn't care as long as they were getting paid. Wow. Um, it, it was a little bit of a kind of mixed culture between partying, having fun. Right kind of that young industry and I suppose that's where that led on to other industries because I had a young family at the time yeah. um, and it was right really where, where do we want to go next wow um that culture that you know there, there are some really big supermarket chains um and not just supermarket chains there's some you know call centers they have that kind of culture where they target their workers are, are quite young um they're not tied down by family and they work them into the ground did, did you when you started out and then you moved into management, were you kind of looking back over your shoulder and thinking, my God, you poor buggers? Um, or were you still <laughs> under that kind of pressure? Yeah. Um, it was still that kind of pressure. And I, I, look, it was a it was a horrible mentality that um, yeah. in, within the club where it was literally we'd try and sap the weakest person on a, across the clubs at any one time. Um, if I was coming back to your club because it was underperforming, we were firing you pretty much and getting a brand new team. Um, it worked for the business model. Yeah. It just wasn't a nice place to work in the end. Okay. And I think okay. being young, you're flashing a lot of money at these people to, to earn. They don't really care. Um, they don't care if they get sacked. You know, they're getting paid. Who, who cares? Yeah. But it wasn't really a sustainable career. Yeah. Emotionally, I'm thinking it must have had an effect after a while. It must have. For me. Yeah. I yeah. I, I think I think they, this is where I was torn between actually what do I want in life? You know, I could go out and party all weekend and then be back into work on Monday morning, wow. still with the same people because yeah. you kind of lived and breathed as a team. Yeah. But I did have a family and yes. I, I suppose there was a decision as to, well, do I want to continue and do this kind of party work life culture yeah. or yeah. do I want to actually find yeah happy with sure. um, I, It's actually, it's, a, it's, it's funny, but I, I, um, I remember being able to work with a hangover. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I, that was yeah, that was a long time ago, mate, because there is no way now. If I now if I ever oh, indulge, yeah. it's like three days of wanting to shoot myself. <laughs> well, that's just how age as well. <laughs> that is that's, that, that's exactly how it is. Um, you went on, in fact, to take exercise for less from one to seventeen clubs across the UK which is pretty no mean feat. Um, so here, Mr. Walker, now things start to get a little bit, or for me anyway, really interesting. At 29, you joined Charles Worth Kennedy, the well-known executive search professionals as an international headhunter, where you built a luxury goods division from scratch with absolutely no prior experience in this industry whatsoever. And I'd like to, I'd like you to bear with me here. <laughs> okay, in as much as, in your own words, you more or less describe yourself as a tough from the rough, right? With little or next to nothing to, rec to recommend himself at, a, at an early age. Yet here we find you, at the age of 29, partnering with some of the most prestigious luxury good companies in the world. Chanel, LVMH, Chopin, De Grisogono, Yvel, Zenith, Dita, Linda Farrow, just to name but a few. What the fuck? How did you get from that... Scruffy little like who was a bit of a sod to working with really high end luxury goods How, companies. How did that happen? I think part of it was was the company I joined. You know, um, you know, I got went into there. They're very family oriented. I remember getting interviewed for several recruitment firms at the time, and they all seemed like it was 
a scene off Wolf of Wall Street where you're going to be throwing a dwarf and, you know, just partying all weekend. That yeah. was the kind of feel they had about them. And I didn't want that. Um, and I came across this little family-owned business, um, very super religious people as well, oh, um, okay. which I just didn't fit that mold um, in the slightest. Um, neither did a couple of the other guys. Um, and I suppose we just hit it off um, with, with, with the one of the main managing directors. Um, you could tell, he, although he had that, religious background he had quite an arrogance about him and i did at the time um we kind of bounced off each other a little bit and um, so i suppose all a lot of that for them giving me the opportunity to do it and i think part of it them saying right well no you must go into recruitment for medical sales or yeah. you know some kind of agriculture or something that they knew i had no interest in that mm. um for me to be able to sell something i've got to believe in it um yeah. and ultimately with recruitment you're not selling anything that's a product so there's nothing you can touch or feel there yeah. so ultimately selling kind of a dream yeah. um where you're, you're giving them some sort of solution so i had to be interested in the product themselves and that led me down well, what do i like i like watches and jewelry and fashion right. uh, like that. Okay. so that's kind of where I, I put this spin on that and them telling me that no i don't think you can do it made me think well actually i'm going to do it anyway yeah um and it's always part of that growing up if somebody tells you you can't do something I'm, I'm going to do it anyway twice as much yes. um and that kind of led me down that route but yeah just the right people around you at the right time i think yeah do you think of yourself as a bit of a rebel yeah 100 percent. yeah if, there, if there's rules to be broken i'll absolutely try and break You're them all the time I, I, can't, I can't help it even when, <laughs> even when it comes to driving you've got to just be above the peak speed limit so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have got so much in common with him, let me tell you. Oh, good God. Do you get road rage in the car? N sometimes. No, not massively, but a little bit, yeah. Okay. It just, right. yeah. But I, I actually, I am married to the, to the quietest, gentlest, sweetest guy. But, I mean, I know he, he looks like dormant, right? But when he's in that car, boy, let me tell you, he's like a psycho. I don't know what it is. It's crazy. It's crazy. Okay. Um, is it true to say, mate, that during this time, you were fighting, kind of fighting a running battle with depression, which, which yeah. um, saw you struggle really um, in, 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 with, with work and work life and home life. Um, mm -hmm. And it also saw you refer to, uh, or get referred rather to, and consult with a life coach. So despite yeah. the achievements of your corporate success, and there were many, you acknowledge, in fact, the, the thrill of the corporate hunt and kill. Um, you were not a happy boy. Would it be mm. fair to say that for you, there was something missing, fundamentally? 100%, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I enjoyed the kill, enjoyed the chase, I enjoyed the industry, you know, the shows, the, the personalities, they're crazy. You know, the Greasy Gone, you can just look at them, they've just been, I think they've just filed for kind of bankruptcy now, and it's really? all to do with landmines and um, who owns them, and I think it's Angola or some, some country like that, somebody owns them, and it's just corrupt, it's crazy. Um, but I found that fascinating at the same yeah. time. You know, I love these big personalities yeah. um, and working with them and engaging with them was a challenge. But ultimately, I didn't really care about the end results. Yeah. You know, if somebody got, got a job, great. They're, they're almost, your product is that person. Um, yeah, so Jay, I'm interested, right? So let's say you, um, you headhunt somebody, you find, you do the selection, the corporate selection, um, and then you get like a bonus if they get the job or how does that Yeah, happen? yeah. So, so we, had, we had kind of a, like a base um, salary. And then in addition to that, we were mainly retained. So 90% of everything I did, I went to the company, kind of, kind of looked at them either with a, I suppose, candidate point of view or going to them and saying, look, I, I can help you out with this campaign. You need a sales director. A lot of the time it was literally me going, right, well, I've just had one sales director at that company. So I'm going to go to the competitor and I'm going to take his sales, sales director and place it back in. Okay. So a lot of it where, you know, look at Dick and Linda Farrow, direct competitors. So what did they do? I took one person from one company and I placed it back in the others. And it worked for me. Um, hey, but, didn't, you, didn't you actually end up like pissing people off? A bit. Uh, no, I think the thing is I got to know them on, a, on almost a friendly level um, right. and ultimately people are going to leave because they want to leave. Yes, yes I'm, I'm calling them up, but when, when you know all the sales directors in that industry and you're the person that they're going to go to, ultimately most people knew that anyway. Yeah. Um, and sometimes people would get annoyed, had the odd client saying, right, well, you've just took our sales director. But I didn't actively approach them if they were active clients. 
Now, if they've got a retain business with me and I, I you know, every month and now I'm not going to touch it, staff. Mm. If anything, they're going to come to me. I'm probably going to then get a couple of CVs of some other sales directors because I know he's leaving anyway. I'm going to pop them on yeah. that guy, guy's desk. So you're, it's, it's always worth having your finger in every pie. And I suppose it's just a bit corrupt. <laughs> Many you it's like, you're, but, you're, but I enjoyed it. It, it yeah. was just the play of one actually, the against other and working them against. There's a little bit of a whiff of the gangster about you, mate, to be honest. <laughs> okay. Um, it was at this point that your your as I said, we, we, we touched on earlier that you um, sought out a, a life coach. And um, it was at this point that your life coach actually said to you, what is it then that makes you happiest? Yeah. And you said, drawing creativity. Go on, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Go on. I think at the time I, I was really into training, but ultimately that was more sort of work with depression as opposed to having an absolute passion for it. Yeah. Um, and I looked back and thought, well, actually, what is it I've ever enjoyed? And it was always drawn. And then she said to me, well, look, where can we take that? Can we work on something? Could you sell paintings? Could you sell drones? And, you know, a drone can take you days, weeks to complete. Yeah. And a couple of hundred quid for it. There's no real profit margin in that. Yeah. Still got a family, still got cars, still got houses, we still got things Mortgage. to pay for. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so ultimately it was a case of looking, what would work? Um, I looked at tattooing. Likewise, a tattooist may only charge 300 quid for an entire day. You can charge that for one set of brows. Yes. Um, and I suppose that's where my wife came in a little bit. Go, well, actually, have you thought about microblading? You know, you can draw. Why can't you do that? Yeah. And then the more I looked into it, the more I came across, you know, people I thought back that I used to work with where they suffered for things like alopecia and things like that. And, you know, everybody's got a story to tell where, you know, somebody that's had cancer. Yes. And it become more appealing from a point of view of, I suppose, Given more to somebody and, and working also, with what yeah. I was doing with the life coach. Yeah, it was all about, well, actually, everything you, you talk about is take, take, take. Yes. And it was to have that. a look at a different perspective of actually, you get a lot more from giving somebody. Yes. somebody. And, yeah. you know, this whole positive affirmation and, you know, yes. law of attraction and things like that. Because if you surround yourself by the right people, you know, you do kind of attract that thing. It's like, yeah. I've surrounded myself with the people I grew up with. And, yeah. you know, it's nothing wrong with people I grew up with. But there was lots of temptations in, in yeah. certain areas, whereas I didn't. You know, I left, joined the army, moved away. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, very interesting. You um, just briefly touched on it, the fact that you were in, a, in an industry that was hard and, and took from people. And then now you find yourself in an industry that is the polar opposite because you're giving. And what we do is a very positive thing. You know, what we hope that, that the people that we do business with, our clients, um, and even as a trainer, the people we train and the people we coach, they leave with a very, very positive experience. Yeah. So that's, I think the comparison between the two is, is really quite marked for, because of the industries that you chose to ultimately, yeah. you know, gain your experience in. Um, so this is when you found microblading and PMU. Um, you said that your wife, um, who is a kind of in the industry, um, she sort of pointed you in that direction. Um, you did your microblade training um, with Holly Houston and your foundation PMU training with Goldeneye UK. You have qualifications in microblading, PMU, scalp microbrigmentation, nipple and areola reconstruct uh, reconstruction and injectable aesthetics. And own and run your own training academy, recently voted Training Academy of the Year at the National Hair and Beauty Awards. Congratulations, well done. You have a team of 14 educators across the whole of the UK covering aesthetics, beauty, skincare, micropigmentation, and um, are still keen to grow further. You have your own clinic, House of Aesthetics, and of course are the co-owner of Bellate, Bellate, Bellate? Latte, yeah. Bellate, beauty Latte. and skincare education. Long story. With your, with your wife, <laughs> Victoria. Who you describe as equally focused and driven and by your side. So that sounds like a special relationship. The answer to you, Mr. Walker, as far as I can see, is art and creativity. Your art has kept you, it's driven you. You could even say, in some respects, it saved you, um, which takes us neatly to your company motto, which I love. The skin to me is just a canvas. The creation of beauty is my art. I, I just love that. That's fab. Mr. Walker, not exactly a textbook narrative journey into our industry, was it? 
no, 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 no slack. nothing cliched about that young man. No. <laughs> no. And I've seen uh, a little of your art and I've actually seen your talent because we've worked together. And what makes me happy about your story is that you're you know, doing something now that you love. Um, however, you are an artist, you are a creative, but it seems to me your corporate roots are still firmly embedded um, and you are clearly weaving the drive and ambition that you honed working for those big national companies into and together with your love of art and PMU. So, <laughs> if I'm when Mr. Walker, you ever decide to take your company public, I want first dibs on bloody shares, mate. I'll be keeping a close eye on you. <laughs> what is your, where do you see your, you guys going? Because the academy is growing. Um, you know, you've got <clears> all <throat> educators now, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Part of setting up an academy in the first place is that we're already teaching for other people. Yeah. Um, within that, within any company structure, you're going to have things that you love. You know, and there was absolutely things we loved about working with, with certain people. The things that you just didn't morally agree with. Right. Um, we've all been on training courses, you know, not naming anybody. But we've always been on a training course. We thought, actually, why did I hear that? You know, yeah. where was the value? Um, and it, it happens. Um, and I suppose what we wanted to do was change that slightly. And, you know, even to the extent where you're going to get sometimes that, you when managing kind of that amount of educators across the UK, yeah. sometimes people just don't get on with that educator. You just don't gel. And, you know, dealing with that kind of situation, it's like, well, actually, let me prove you wrong. You know, let me come back and retrain you. Let me come down there and meet you, see what went wrong and kind of overcome that. Rather than going, well, no, sorry, you've had your money. See you later. You read the terms and conditions. That's that. Um, so I suppose that was, was where it came from. And my wife is absolutely adamant that she has to deliver the best of everything she does. Yes. Um, you know, even to the fact that she's constantly on my case. <laughs> we're just about to move premises into a, a new build, building and it's going to be great because we enjoy working to get, together but I know if I want to take a nap for 20 minutes on the sofa in my place there's no issue it's never going to happen in the new place <laughs> 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 so afternoon naps are on the head now um, right. but yeah okay. I think it, it's part of it look Pilates from that side of things yeah we, we both got an investment in it you know there's both an equal pa passion there in many ways but she's a driving force without a doubt behind that company. You know, yeah. I can't just credits. Um, you know, yeah. Wow, awesome. Um, I gotta tell you, I think that the hot this when when we've we've spoken and I was I was doing my research and um, my due diligence, getting all my facts and stuff, I just thought the whole story was pretty heartwarming. And you and your wife seem like such a strong team. Um, and it's a great feeling because I, 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 it's not very often I meet, I mean, I haven't met Victoria because I work with the person and live, live with the, work with the person I live with, live with the person I work with. And I think we have a quite strong uh, bond, strong um, relationship. And we work together well and obviously we live together well. When I do meet other couples, it's always interesting because I, like with Jasper and Debbie, yeah, you know, they, those two bounce off, bounce off each other. Yeah, amazing company, but work so well together. And I don't think it's entirely usual. I got the comments I hear most, and I wonder if you ever hear this is, how, how do you do it? How do you yeah, work with it? 100%. Yeah. Don't, don't get wrong, there's always up and down days, aren't there? And, you know, there's that day when, you know, one of you get out of bed and you're just a miserable get for that, for that day. Right. But, but I suppose the 90% the of the time, it's enjoyable. Yeah. Um, and if anything, I suppose we bounce off at each other that if she's having a bad day, I'm usually there trying to pick her back up and vice yeah. versa. Yeah. Um, and you kind of know each other's flaws and you know where, actually, I probably need to support you in this area. Yeah. You don't get that from typical colleagues that you work from. You, you know, uh, you don't have that mate, close relationship. Is, um, Victoria, is she your best mate? 100%, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Good. Right. So, here we go. Let's do some questions. What is your go-to machine? Oh, go to machine. I suppose for me, I've used quite a few now. Um, I absolutely love the Airtronic by Goldeneye. Okay. Um, one of the first semi permanent make, make machines I've used. Very, very soft when it hits the, the skin. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I've used things like Zion, Root Quill, um, Cheyenne Hawk. Um, yeah. And then more so some cost effective machines I've tried, such as Mass, Mass 2, and Mass Nano. I just um, I know you, you, you had a try yeah, one of them. Great. And look, they're soft. They, they do what what they do, especially at that price point as well yeah. for anybody entering the industry. Yeah, but I think ultimately, for me, it's about having a light machine. I'm very heavy handed, so anything that's really soft and gentle is important. Yeah. But if I'm honest, I think 
being a in semi permanent maker or any artist should be able to use absolutely anything. Yes. Because it's not just the machine, it's a combination of hand speed technique, yeah. needles, pigments, yeah. understanding the skin, what's in front of you, what it's going to heal like. All of that comes together. And the only way you can ever understand that is by doing. Yes. You know, you kind of using it, really. Yeah, I absolutely 100% agree with you. Um, in fact, I got, um, I got Debbie to send me the Airtronic because I've never tried it. So she's, oh. I think Jasper posted it yesterday and I'm super excited to give it a try because I spoke to a few people that said, you know, Scott, you're going to love it. And I feel the same as you. I think that um, it's a combination, it's elements, isn't it, that yeah. involve yeah. in creating good work. It's not just the machine that is relevant, but it's a combination of a lot of factors that go into producing good work. And like you, I am um, naturally heavy handed. So for me to, to, to work very lightly takes a lot of energy, you know? I think, I, I think we even did an exercise during one, one, one of your training sessions where you were trying to show people that turn the speed of the machine up would impact the amount of ink going in. And yeah. I think you, I'm frustrated a little bit that it didn't do that when we did that because literally I just adapted the, the, how heavy my hand was. Right. And continue doing the same, and I remember you sat me going, "Right, yeah, you weren't meant to do that." But <laughs> <laughs> okay, needles. What's your favourite needles? Do you know what? I've started using some crystal cosmetic cartridges, and they where did I get them from? Tattoo Lands. Um, okay. I like them. They're they're not too long. You you've got a longer tape, or a shorter tape that you can do, but some of them are really really fine. So a number three needle. I think it goes down to as, num as thick as an 18, no point 18. Okay. So it's really, really fine. Um, but at the same time, Bishop, pretty much anything, really. Anything that's half decent, really. I haven't seen the crystal ones. I'll have to look out for those and, uh, and give those a go. What is your favourite pigment? What's your go-to pigment? Again, a little bit torn here. Um, I bought golden eye pigments, and I mean, I bought everything. Um, so absolutely love them. Um, oh, you know, from that yeah. point of view, they you know, organic, they've got the skin fast, heal very, very well. Um, the colour's true to colour. Yeah. But at the same time, recently I've been using Monica's. Um, oh, and especially yeah. from a, a teaching point of view, it's four colours. Beginning, certainly, to begin, is keeping it simple is definitely an advantage. Um, Ian, what can you just simply not work without when you're in the clinic? Coffee, 100%. <laughs> so all day, every day. Um, to the extent, I think during lockdown, Vicky came home with about seven different packets of flavoured coffee just to get me through lockdown. Right, okay. <laughs> so I was actually expecting something technical then, so you surprised me with Absolutely that. Absolutely not. As long as I've got a brew, um, I'm quite happy from that Excellent. point of view. Well, tell me what continues to inspire you to work in the industry. You know what? I've been impressed with lockdown. Um, I personally find a lot of the groups at times people tear each other apart oh, and, you, and somebody new puts something up and they literally tear each other apart. But a lot of the big personalities during lockdown, it's been all about actually, why are you doing that? Show a bit more kindness. I think now they're not as busy. Mm. Kind of got time on the hands to go, hang on, why are you doing that? Why are you tearing each other apart? Why don't you go back down to just giving some constructive criticism? Yeah. So I think personalities are a big thing for me. Right. I actually um, have a kind of a love-hate relationship with forums and in fact, in so, social media in general. And so yeah. I, CJ kind of acts as a buffer against all of that. Um, he posts most of the stuff that I have to post, you know, for obvious reasons, marketing, etc. And I stopped being quite as active, mate, on some of the forums, really because of the kind of mob mentality of the cruelty and, and, and putting people down often when they're just simply asking for help. Uh, and I just, you know, I just had to back away. Uh, um, uh, and I, I think when we come out of lockdown as well, the, the amount of salons and clinics that they'll be reporting each other rather than going, do you know what, why aren't you doing this? Mm. Giving actual advice, it, it's, it's just, I don't get it. It's sad, it's sad. Um, if you had unlimited resources, Walker, and could open a clinic and live and work full or part-time anywhere in the world, where would you and Vicky be, and why would you be there? Italy, without a doubt. Italy. I think we've we've got both got an absolute love for Italy. You know, Venice, Florence, wherever really. Um, the food, the people. Um, I just I've worked a lot with Italians in fashion. They're just nice people. Yeah. From a work point of view, I think also Italian women just have beautiful skin, beautiful yes. brows. Yeah. Easy to work on this. <laughs> 
and that's been a little bit selfish as well. Yeah, sure. Love it, Tony. I'm, I'm with you all the way. Um, if you had an unlimited budget, what innovation would you want to create or make for our industry? I think for me, it's, it's about bringing two industries together. Okay. Look at the tattoo industry and semi-permanent makeup industry. There's kind of a, like a love-hate relationship. Yeah. Um, I personally found that a lot of people within semi-permanent makeup still view tattoo artists as being the, you know, hairy bikers that they once were. Um, okay. You know, there's certainly some still bad clinics out there, but a lot of them are artists, absolutely incredible artists, yeah. um, without a doubt. On the flip side of that, tattoos look at semi-permanent makeup industry as in you do a two-day course and you tattoo in the skin. Right. So that guy's done some kind of a two-year apprenticeship or, or yeah. something just to get to the stage of starting to tattoo the skin. Yes. Um, but at the same time, semi-permanent makeup industry, we invest a lot in courses, knowledge, anatomy and physiology, pigmentation, how it works under the skin. You ask a typical tattooist anything about the skin, I haven't got a clue. No. You can create something beautiful yeah. through, I suppose, learning from a practical point of view, but there's no non-dependent knowledge whatsoever. Um, and I think this is where, yeah, I want to see a big difference. I wow. think tattooists, without a doubt, need, you know, if, if somebody came for an interview to be a tattooist in your yeah. studio, they could both, you know, draw, but one had the knowledge of AMP and everything else that goes with that. Fundamentals of things like safe practice and cleanliness and everything that goes with that yeah. as well. Who are you going to choose every single time? Yeah. You're not just going to choose the other guy. Yeah. And I just think it lacks so much that industry in that way. And that's not saying that, you know, there's a lack of cleanliness or anything because there's not. But there's just no formal entry level qualification. Yes. Yeah. And on the other side, you've got people within this industry, Paula McDonald's, her work, her art, unbelievable. Yes. You know, why, why don't you see more people like that doing more floral designs, stuff like that? Stuff that's almost in keeping with their clientele. Yes, yeah. That's really interesting. And actually, I've never really thought about it. And I'm aware of the um, almost sort of subliminal opposition between those two mm -hmm. industries. Um, I also, you know, that's not to say that every tattoo artist feels like that. Um, no, actually, not at all. I have immense respect for tattoo artists and I have, believe it or not, mate, I've got a couple of tattoo artist clients who come to yeah. me for their brows and all the rest of it and who will say to me, I, I, you know, what you do is very different to what I do. I actually yeah. don't think that. I actually think, I actually think that when we're, we are, you know, cousins, maybe distant, but we're cousins. And it's something that we should, I love your idea of maybe bringing those industries closer and working together in more in a community rather than keeping that sort of distance of us apart. That's, um, that's awesome. I love that. Um, what do you think the landscape of our industry is going to look like in 10 years time? Where do you think we're going to be in 10 years? Bearing in mind what's just happened and the situation with COVID and all the rest of it. Well, <laughs> that was one of the points. It's a tough one, isn't it? I think the whole, at the end of the day, our practice and what we do, the fundamentals of bringing somebody in cleanliness, hygiene, we practice anywhere. So the early stages of COVID, we're all kind of looking at each other going, what are you talking about? I do that anyway. Yeah. Why beauticians and hairdressers are flapping over and it's, look, they don't require it. They're not breaking the skin. But we're going, right, well, we do that anyway. Yeah. Um, and we wear masks and we wear gloves and, and, and yeah. we observe, you know, sterile field and cross-contamination. And yeah, absolutely. It's standard practice for us. Yeah. And then you look at things like, McDonald's drive throughs open, but we're not allowed to open yet. Yeah. I, I just don't get my head around where, where, where it will go. I think COVID will disappear. I think people will get fed up um, of just doing doing it and just go get on with life. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, six months from now, I don't think it'll be mentioned again. No. There's a lot of other things that have gone on over the last couple of weeks, which I really want to get into. But yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just a crazy time that we live in. Um, yeah. Other than that, I think, you know, my prediction about the two industries coming together, I do see that happening in the next, next 100%, yeah. It would be really a great thing for the two industries to, to find some common ground, you know? Um, who is your PMU hero or heroine and why? Stuff on this. Um, I think ultimately I've trained with quite a few people. You know, Debbie, without a doubt, her knowledge, Debbie Clifford, is second to none. Oh, pigmentology, oh, shocking. mind blow. She's probably 
you know, forgot more than what some people will learn in the industry. Yeah. But at the same time, she's a genuine person, her yeah. Jasper, and yeah. has absolutely got a heart of gold. Yes. Um, you yourself, you know, oh, shut at up. the end of the day. <laughs> no, seriously, you know, I, I've trained with you um, not so long back, and it was an absolute masterclass of engagement. You know, you, you're looking at fundamentals, the basics yes. of, yes. you know, what everybody should be doing, and everybody's around the class going, well, yeah, why aren't we doing that? Yeah. And they knew they should be doing it, and you just almost putting it together like yeah. with some kind of performance. The, the, the engagement's there. Yeah. And I think that's the difference between you're a fabulous, you know, semi perfect makeup artist and you're an unbelievable teacher. Oh, and, that's you know, oh, you, you, that's you, so nice of you. That. And then I'd probably say, yeah, I'm keen on getting something done with Monica. Um, oh, me so too. Learn from her. Yeah, she is so on my hit list. Monica yeah. and um, Miriam as well. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's yeah. a long list, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, there is, Stephanie. Yeah, there's loads. You know, Callie I'd like to work with. Vicky Martin I want to work with. Yeah, there's... I, yeah. And funny enough, Leila Hinchin and I did an interview um, yeah. for her PMU Circle. And it was one of the questions that came up. And I, I wonder whether you've had the same thing, but lockdown has made me look at homegrown artists. You know, because I would... Historically, I'd bugger off to Latvia or go to Greece or go to yeah. wherever. Now yeah. I'm at home and I'm thinking... Hang on a minute. Some of these guys. What else? Are cool. doing? Oh yeah, they're awesome. You know. So yeah, I'm with you all the way. Um, you, you know yourself when you get somebody that's already qualified and they come into one of your classes. There's always something you may well take away from them. Yeah. A machine they use, a pigment they use, yes. a, a, a technique. There's always yeah. something you can learn yourself. Absolutely. I don't think I've ever done a class where I haven't learned something off a student, even if they've only just started. They'll make me think about something in a different way. And I love that about we, what we do. And as a trainer, you know, yourself, you know, you, you, you can have a, a room full of students and you go in with a set idea of what you're going to teach and what, you, what skills you're going to transfer. And when you leave at the end of the day, you think to yourself, well, actually, I'm taken away, you know, almost as much as I've given in because there's stuff that, that you think about that maybe in from a different perspective. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. No, absolutely. Agree. Yeah. Okay, so we've done um, your journey. I want to talk to you now about work and work life um, a little bit. Um, things don't always go um, as expected. You know, we work with clients, we work with public. Um, have you ever had a time when you didn't meet a client's expectations? 100%. Tell us, tell 100%. us what happened. 100%. <laughs> tell us what happened and how did you turn it if around? If you don't look at your early work and cringe, you're not progressing. Yeah. End of. Yeah. You know, I look, I look at work and think, what, what was he doing? Yeah. And don't get me wrong, at the time I loved them, the client loved them. But yeah. there was one particular client where her and a friend came in. And I'm quite happy for you to bring a friend to, to the appointments. Um, I, like, think, I see it as, I see it as in, <laughs> if, if you've got something to say, your best mate's going to tell you, I think you look ridiculous. Right. Um, and I think on this one occasion, she was happy with the brow, she was happy with the shape. A friend was kind of happy with them as well. She was kind of pushing to go Pam Landerson thin but we went back to something quite normal. Um, and then she loved them. Everything was happy. Loads of smiling faces, selfies and everything. Two days later, she met, met, messaged me saying she hated them. Right. And I was like, wow. <laughs> yeah. And I think, ultimately, I let her friend have too much say. Right. And maybe I should have thought about, actually, was she quite a dominant personality in the situation? And don't go wrong, I've, I've since removed them, I think. Actually, she looked in very, very soon for, for an additional removal um, and we're pretty much completely gone to start again. Right. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's tough, isn't it? You know, yes. sometimes I've, I've sat there with some the client and they've not known what they've wanted. I've literally sent them away and said, well, I'll tell you what, come back in two weeks. Yes. Tell me what you want, because yeah. ultimately, once we've stuck that powder brow on, we're not seeing hair struggles. Yeah. What is it you want? <laughs> and there's so many people, as you know, turn up to an appointment and haven't got a clue what they're looking no, for. Not a clue. Um, I've, had, I, I've literally had people walking in asking for microblading, and then when they show me the, the picture on the phone, I'm booked in for microblading. Okay, my darling, have you got a? You, have you got any visual <laughs> reference? Yeah, look, and it's an ombre brow. <laughs> because they're, 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 even the term is not, you know, they're, they're not exactly sure on the term they're using. Well, look, they, this is my other pet hate in the industry: digital microblading. No. Yeah. No. Yeah, just that shut up. Okay. No. If it's not done with a blade, it's not microblading. So I've got... Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm not talking about that any further because I'll get into trouble. Someone will bloody shoot me. Okay. Um, how has a client most spectacularly surprised you? 
Probably see, I'm not going to name her, no. but we have a client that she suffers from a condition called facial dysmorphia. Okay. Pretty much. So she sees herself in the mirror and literally hates her appearance, full stop oh. hates it. Okay. And she wants brows done. Um, and for me, I was quite nervous, probably the most nervous I've been because ultimately what she sees, she doesn't like. Right. So how can I make a massive difference? I know when she looks in the mirror, she freaks out full stop. Okay. So how do I show what she wants and what, what she likes? So we kind of work with it by me taking photos of her, photos of her laid down, photos zoomed in, just the eye, you know, without other facial features in, and then kind of give her that. And she's like, well, yeah, I like the shape, like everything. So we went on, we did it. Absolutely, probably one of the best pair, pair of brows I've ever done. Yeah. And I handed, handed her my phone after taking photos. Again, I didn't want to take any kind of mirror to her. And she literally burst out crying. Oh, my God. Thinking, I've screwed my oh, life up. <laughs> no! And then she put down the phone very, very calmly and just hugged me and kept crying. And I'm like, so they're like, is this good crying? Is it bad crying? <laughs> what is we've got? <laughs> In the end, she's absolutely over the moon with it. And no you know, she came back to our clinic between myself and Vicky, had lots of them, you know, a little bit, not nothing big, nothing in your face, but little things like little lips and fillers and just. Just making her look a little bit younger myself. Nothing over the top, nothing right. exaggerated. But it was actually a surprise to the extent where you think, I've ruined somebody's life. Yeah. <laughs> you thought she burst into tears and you thought you, she was... You yeah, thought, I, I thought she hated them. Right, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Brilliant. Tell me about a time, if ever, that you have just wanted to throw the towel in and I can't do this anymore. In this industry, absolutely not. Ah, oh, brilliant. Brilliant. It's not even light work. I've got to work. I draw on your face. Yeah. Not exactly work, is it? Yeah, no. Um, no, I know what you mean. It's, um, for me, I'm doing something that I really want to do. Yeah. So I, I want to go to work. Um, and I've had jobs where I have not wanted to go to work. And I know the yeah. difference, you know? And you yourself have had that, where you've, you know, yeah. it, 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 that's not a good, that's not Depression a good way to learn. Yeah, it's not a good way to live. Okay, tell me about a time when you felt like an absolute hero in work. I think recently, January, I think it was okay. January, yeah. Early part of this year anyway, I was in hospital, had an appendix out, um, and literally got a message just before I was about to go down for operation, just saying, look, I need my brows done. Um, and this woman basically wanted her brows done. Um, she was just about to start chemotherapy within okay. seven days. Okay. So it's a case, you know, yourself, you've got to get it done now. You want them to at least partially heal before you start any chemo or whatsoever. Um, and I think literally I had the operation, came out the next day, and then the day after I was doing a brows. And for her, just it was life changing. Do you know what I mean? It's She didn't look at her kids and. You know, she, the, thing, the whole thing is she didn't want to scare children. And she's not the first person ever to say that. You know, the, the amount of people that come in and just, they want to set their eyebrows just so they don't look at the children and yeah. think, actually, what is it? You know, you can put yeah. a wig on. Oh, God. Still missing the brows. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's little things like that. It's you just giving something to somebody that yes. needs it. It's not yeah. just aesthetics, is it? Yes. It's not just want to look good. I just want to feel like me. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting actually, but my, 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 the answer to that question, my answer to that question is very similar to yours. And um, it was that kind of situation for me too. And I actually, um, I, I realized the gravity of what I was doing because my background is hair and makeup, which is always considered to be very superficial. Yeah. I, think it was yeah. Harold, I think it was Harold Wilson who called hairdressing a candy floss industry despite the billions of <laughs> over the years of pounds that it's, you know, uh, that, that it's put into the economy. Um, and there was, the, I think the, the dignity of it is what sunk in for me of what I was doing, you know, giving somebody, um, making such a difference to, to, some, to, the, to somebody's sovereignty over their own body, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. it's a big thing. And it's, um, I'm with you 100% on that. How have you coped with lockdown? <laughs> In your because you 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 and Vicky are driven and you're um, focused and someone has come along and gone stop. Yeah. So how are you guys how are you guys cope? I think like anybody, there's, there's tough spells, isn't there? You know, at the beginning, it was all right. I drank a lot. 
Yeah, um, me too. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was like a mini holiday. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. you kind of go through that phase of actually, I'm fed up with drinking now. Um, I want to go back to the gym. I want to go for a swim. I want to do all the things I used to be doing. And you just couldn't do it. So I suppose I cope with it by spending a small fortune on gym equipment and boxing equipment. That's all in the garage. <laughs> and, but you know what, mate? Yeah. You, were lucky. you were lucky you got it because we couldn't get, CJ couldn't get gym equipment for love nor money. I mean, they're selling yeah. dumbbells for like £150 a pair. Just ridiculous. I've paid a ridiculous amount for them. Yeah. Well, yeah. I knew I needed them. Um, I needed to go in there and, you know, I'm not feeling great today. 20 minutes in there on the bag, you, you're feeling good again. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was just, it was a must more than anything else. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I think the huge positive is the amount of time you've had with your family. Yes. You know, um, you know, you're locked in, don't get wrong, you'll be frustrating that time, but you're never going to get that time again. No. When are you even going to get time to sort your garden? Our garden's been out done, it's got decking, it's got a jacuzzi, yeah. it's got everything that, that the kids need. And ultimately, we've still worked. You know, we've been in a fortunate position where we've got online training, we've got other elements where people can either start doing a course, then come in and finish later on. So you're not getting the same turnover, without a doubt, is what you would, but we've not stopped mm. as such. We've just kind of ticked over. Mm. So, I, personally, I think we've been lucky. Yeah, me too. When lockdown's lifted, what's the first thing you guys will do? Uh, mini break somewhere. We've already booked holidays anyway for the, the end of this year. So, yeah. Tenerife for New Year, Lake Garda in May, because we were meant to be away in oh Lake Garda. God, Lake Garda's um, beautiful. Yeah, I, it's probably the only holiday I'm that bothered about losing. Um, yeah, it's just going to be little, little yeah. breaks, breaks, I think. Yeah. You, okay, hypothetical. You just won yeah. a million pounds on the lottery. Yeah. What is the first thing that you will do with that money? And would you continue to work? 100% continue to work, without question. Um, I think we'd certainly have a different lifestyle. Um, we've never really wanted to be in the UK. Yeah. You know, living abroad, working abroad. We've got friends that work abroad. Um, I think that would be probably a focus, be yeah. it Leo anywhere really yeah. um little things like families mortgages and stuff like that yeah as anybody would do i, yeah. Th I think yeah yeah sure okay um okay if you were a superhero mr walker or a super villain who would you yeah. be a random question <laughs> I know. well i get to do this i get to ask stupid <laughs> fun questions so who would you think if you're going to be a superhero or well, superhero villain? thing yeah it's massively never appealed to me. So, you know, Marvel and things like that, yeah, all right, but they're not that great. But if anything, probably Deadpool. I think oh, his okay. humor is just strange. Yes, weird. Yeah. He's and weird. Harley Quinn as well. Yeah. She's oh, one of those, God, those yeah. kind of psychopathic, tattoo kind of crazy women that. Yeah. You like that? Married. Yeah. Married? <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Okay. What was the last present somebody got for you, buddy? Got me? Yeah. Oh. Vicky actually bought me a trip to Rome. Wow. Um, we didn't go. <laughs> so nothing I could physically have, but yeah. Well, that's impressive. What was the last present you got for someone? Barbie aeroplane. Um, <laughs> for, your little, for your little one? Yeah, yeah. She just wanted it, so we, yeah. I think we're fortunate to be in the position where we're a bit like that with our kids. They want to, they, they kind of get it. And yeah. I think most kids do nowadays. It's a very different yeah. world we live in. Um, but yeah, it's usually something like that. Yeah, I was, I gotta be honest, I was the same with my boys. Um, yeah, um, I, 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 was, I was just mental with them when they, especially when they were little, you know, when they were yeah, like I, three or five. I do get in trouble because we, we, <laughs> we have this thing with, with my youngest where she loves cake, obsessed with eating cake. Cake, right. So, yeah, just birthday cake. Cake in right. general, she loves cake. Right. So I think this year alone, she's probably had about five birthdays where we literally, <laughs> on, a, on a Saturday morning, we'll go and buy party food and we'll literally just throw a little party for no reason whatsoever. That's amazing. But yeah, she, she just loves birthdays. Brilliant, that's brilliant. <laughs> so, what was the best present you have ever had? I think Vicky and I tend to do presents doing things now. You know, you can buy shoes and handbags all day long anyway and she buys them herself a lot of the time anyway yeah um probably a trip to venice um she got me from the 30th and we literally just went away for 
a long weekend. Um, and I just think, just getting lost in streets, the street food, the chichetti, the wine, stuff like that. Just, yeah, that, that's us. Eat, stroll around. Yeah, it's interesting that. It's because, but, um, <laughs> time and memories, really, as well. As I mean, food and wine is obviously important to you because, you know, you like that. Do you cook, mate? Um, when I cook, I, I cook well. Um, lockdown, we've cooked a lot. And we've yeah. done a lot of outdoor cooking. Yeah. Um, we we have fallen in the trap before lockdown of ordering takeaways or going out for food. Yeah. Because it's just easy. You work eight, ten hours. Let's just get something in. Yeah. Um, but when we cook, yeah, we cook well. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, if you could have uh, no prizes for guessing what you're going to say, I was going to say, if you could learn any language in the world, which <laughs> language would you learn and why? Italian. Uh, well, uh, do you know what? it's just beautiful yeah. you, you, you listen to it and it just rolls off the tongue doesn't yeah. it it's yeah. a beautiful language it is yeah I have to say I have I actually uh, speak five languages um, all menu languages so I can speak I can read a menu in order in French Italian Spanish German and what was the other one no that's it four so um and, and I, I'm actually I'm, <laughs> God, mate, I'm actually quite good but I'm like a little parrot so if somebody says something to me, I can repeat it back, you know, almost yeah. verbatim. Um, and one of the problems with that is quite often, is when we go to France a lot, I love France, my French is better than all the other languages, but one of the problems with when you speak and, and you can pronounce quite well, the person that you're speaking to thinks you're better than you really are. So yeah. quite often, and, then ask, go off and, yeah, and you're like, oh, well, I don't, and you're like, I don't know the fuck you're talking about. Oh, I'm like, I'm <laughs> <laughs> and CJ's interesting. He speaks absolutely no languages whatsoever, except when he's had about two bottles of Merlot. And then he's <laughs> bloody fluent in just about anything you throw at him, he'll have a go. Yeah, he's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Okay. It's confidence, that, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Yeah. Know what it is. If you were stuck on a desert island, mate, and you had all the food, water, and shelter you needed, what would be the three personal items that you would bring you'd have to have anything but three personal <laughs> items i think ultimately just art stuff yeah. um confining that down to three when if you draw yourself you know how much you have yeah probably just paper pencils and a rubber yeah i'll be quite happy yeah yeah I, I those would be the only things for me so um you get this part of the the little talk that we do you get to ask me some questions so you get three questions, so go on, give me a go. I suppose I'd quite like to see where you see yourself developing in the next te like next 10 years from what you've done so far. Because right. I know you've done a lot within hairdressing and yeah. then you've moved into makeup from what Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, a, I was a hairdresser for um, Casey, my eldest boy now is 30, 31, I think, and he's 33 years. What I should have done is I should have taught in that industry because I'm a natural presenter and a natural coach. That's, I'm, I'm at home doing this, you know? I like to learn about something and, I, and it's natural for me then to tell its story or teach it. So I think probably I'll continue working on presenting and coaching. Um, I, I mean, ultimately I don't know where that will take me, but, but that's probably where I'm gonna focus. Mm. Yeah. Okay. What What do you think would change about the industry, or what would sorry? What would you change about the industry? Regulation. Okay. If I was the king, I would regulate both the PMU and tattoo industries. Yeah. Because I think while they are unregulated, we are in effect second class citizens, and I think that it would it would protect us and it would protect our clients and it would yeah. give us and it would add to the integrity of the industry so that's what yeah, I, would, I think in some in some form um, there needs to be some kind of regulation and also with regards to our training in these industries here yeah you no know? so how how do you measure um a tra how do you externally measure a training yeah. um facility curriculum course you know i mean there are independent verifiers but 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 it's not we're not regulated okay. so you don't have to you don't have to abide by their rules you don't have to adhere to the structures that they set forward that's really what what i'm when i say regulation that's really what i'm thinking of is protecting students clients and us 
um, as technicians and trainers. Mm, that's what I do. So finally, yeah. what's your favourite pigments for lips, eyeliner, and brows? But why are they yeah. your favourite? Yeah, um, um, I get obviously I get asked this a lot, and um, um, my favourite uh, pigments uh, right now and have been for the last four years, I guess four years. Yeah, um, Perma Blend, Tina Davis. Uh, Tina sent me hers first, so I've been using Tina's uh, pigments. Since she launched them, I love them straight away. Lucky boy. <laughs> yeah, Perma Blend because obviously Perma Blend is the mother company, uh, yeah. and tones of Perma Blend by Naomi O'Hara. Um, yeah. she's created her own Perma Blend range, three ranges, and in fact, anything um, by world famous Tattoo Inc., which is the mother company of Perma Blend. I'm, I'm always interested. I've said, I make no bones about the fact, I've said before that I run dual insurance, I have tattoo insurance as well as PMU insurance, so I can use, you know, I can use legally and, and I'm insured to use um, tattoo ink. Why is slightly more interesting. Um, yeah. Why is because I like very low viscosity, so I like really thin watery pigments to work with, and they suit very well my personal technique, which is mainly pixel work mainly so th th really that's in a nutshell that's what that, you know that's why i like them it's because i think low viscosity pigment is easier to work with than the oily thicker pigment yeah mm. okay. there you go okay so it, it only remains for me to thank you for your time for your um, commitment and your input to um to spillity and what I can only describe is a really uplifting, heartwarming story. I am so chuffed, mate, that you came on and shared um, your little chunk of how your journey, how you got to PMU, and the very, very interesting way that, that you actually got into the industry. Um, I, I, I do want to say before you go that I would love to catch up with you and Victoria in a couple of months. I know you, you're opening a, a new academy um, and you're moving premises, and that sounds like an exciting time for you guys. And I think it would be really cool to get you both on and have a chat see what you're doing, what you're up to, where you've been, where you're going. How do you feel about that? Absolutely, yeah. I know Vicky will be 100% up for that. She'll uh, be good at so, it. Yeah, oh, she'll be good. She loves the centre of attention. So. Does she? Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. It's all about Vicky. <laughs> yeah, good. Did you enjoy, mate? No, I did. No, look, thank you. From my point of view, it's been really enjoyable. Oh, and thank, you. thank you for having me as well. You know, I do appreciate it. Thank you very much. You take care. Uh, give my best of regards to everybody, and I'll speak to you soon, okay? All right, speak to me. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.